Welcome to special coverage of Afghanistan, where the Taliban is now effectively in control, including in the capital, Kabul. A takeover of the city has triggered deadly scenes of panic at the airport. As people desperately try to leave, the international community is now calling on the Taliban to ensure the protection of life and property. We start with this report from our diplomatic correspondent, Paul Adams. At Kabul airport, the desperation is dangerous. An American military transport plane on the runway this morning, mobbed by Afghans trying to flee their country. Eventually, the plane takes off. Moments later, as it gains altitude, it appears that two people fall to the ground. Thousands of American and British troops have been sent to secure the airport. With helicopters being used to clear the runway, it's chaotic and ugly. Similar scenes on the civilian side. An Afghan airliner unable to leave as crowds frantically try to reach it. Outside the gates, shots ring out as the headlong dash which began yesterday continues. At least two people have died at the airport today, perhaps more. What a contrast with the city's deserted green zone. Once home to government buildings and foreign embassies, now empty but for pockets of Taliban fighters. In a message posted on social media from their political base in Qatar, the Taliban's co-founder, Abdul Ghani Barada, urged his men to remain disciplined. Now we have to show that we can serve our nation, he said. We want an Afghan inclusive uh, Islamic uh, government. Uh, so uh, by that we mean all other Afghans have also participation in that government. So of course that need uh, a little bit time and uh, deliberation and uh, talks. Anxious moments for the people of Kabul, unsure what their new masters have in mind. What will their lives be like? Some skeptical that the Taliban can be taken at their word. So what they are saying, of course, they are looking for legitimacy from all these different countries to be uh, accepted as like, you know, the legitimate government of Afghanistan. But then at the same time, what are they doing in practice? A, either they don't have a control on their foot soldiers or B, they really want the legitimacy, but they are not willing to do the work. Huge uncertainty, too, for the aid agencies on whom so many Afghans rely. UNICEF has been in Afghanistan for decades, helping with education and health. We will be continuing our work. The Taliban has asked us to stay. Um, they understand the importance of our work. They understand that we're not political. Um, they've asked us to pause our work for a couple of days while they talk to the rank and file um, and make sure that they understand what UNICEF is here to do um, and that our staff can operate safely. Afghans have seen so much tumultuous change, experienced so many moments of trauma. This is another such moment. What will it mean for those who leave and those who stay? Paul Adams, BBC News. Let's speak to our correspondent, Lise Doucette, uh, who joins us now uh, from Dubai. Lise, um, you and I love Afghanistan. It's, it's been an incredibly difficult time to watch these scenes, especially in Kabul. Yeah, as you know, in recent months, there's been much speculation, analysis about what would happen in the last days of the U.S.-led troop uh, involvement in Afghanistan, what would happen after the last of U.S. forces leave. But I think this is beyond anything, even the worst case scenarios that many had speculated about and many had feared, deeply feared. The scenes from Kabul International Airport are frightening and heartbreaking. Thousands of people desperately trying to find a way out, any way out. The U.S. forces struggling to maintain uh, control. And inside the city of Kabul, and of course, we're just mainly getting reports from Kabul, there's the rest of Afghanistan, which are suddenly find themselves under Taliban control. It's this idea about the, the new order has not yet been established and the old order is falling apart. And 
I, you know, we've been reporting about that, you know, some Afghans we hear from are hiding in their homes. They don't want the Taliban to know there. Those who venture out are questioned. We do know that the Taliban are trying to send reassuring messages saying we're in charge now. There's nothing to fear, that we, we are establishing order. But I think these are really, really uh, frightening times uh, for the people of Afghanistan. While this chaos and disorder continues, people just don't know what lies ahead. And the scenes from the airport underlines that many Afghans don't want to stay around to find out. Indeed, that's, uh, as you say, what it sort of symbolizes, because, of course, the city center is very quiet, it's very calm, and then you drive half an hour to the airport and utter chaos, people clinging uh, onto the aircraft as, as it's taxiing and, and leaving. I mean, you're, you're in Dubai, you're supposed to be in Kabul, but you can't actually get a flight at this point in time. Uh, tell our viewers about hovering over Kabul, how difficult it was, because you couldn't actually land. And, and the airport now is closed. We're not sure when it will actually open. Yes, the commercial, all commercial air traffic into Afghanistan has now been suspended. And when we say commercial air traffic, it's not simply a question of normal, you know, flights going in and out of Kabul. These are lifelines for Afghans who are those Afghans who are desperately trying to escape. In my case, we flew on the on Emirates. Uh, we were one, I think, one of the last commercial flights to try to go into Kabul yesterday. We hovered over the city of Kabul for about an hour and then returned to turn turn back. We were diverted back to Dubai. And the staff on the airplane said, you know, they, were, they regretted that we couldn't land. It was simply not possible. But they also expressed regret that they were supposed to pick up more than 400 Afghans who were waiting on the tarmac. And that included, they said, 100 children. And in those young people, we understand, were the girls who were part of the widely acclaimed robotics team of Afghanistan, the university high school students who had won a global prize uh, in developing the, uh, robots in the western city of Herat. And an example, if one was needed, the, the kinds of success stories of Afghanistan that had been held up by the international community, who promised time and again to ensure, to use the phrase, the gains of the last 20 years were protected. And of course, there was a lot of goodwill and there was a lot of intention to try to ensure that the what had been achieved over the last 20 years of intense international engagement would be protected. But right now, many of those young people, that new young educated generation, are either hiding in their homes or they're trembling on the tarmac, wondering whether they'll be able to get out. And if they don't get out, what about all their dreams of university? The Taliban say, of course, they've told us many times, they told you, Yalda, just at the weekend again, uh, that they will allow all the rights of women and girls uh, within Islam, that women will be able to work, that girls will be able to study. But the reports that we're getting from districts across Afghanistan, where the Taliban are in control now, belie that, uh, that girls aren't going to school, that women are being told uh, to, to stay at home and not go to work. So there are huge question marks about the future. And for many Afghans, these question marks are not just about day-to-day -day lives. They're existential. It's about their very future and their very, their very sense of belonging in their own country. Yeah, it's not just about the provinces, Liz. We just uh, got some confirmed reports that the American University of Afghanistan is now a Taliban uh, headquarter and, and base. Uh, Liz, thank you very much for joining us and for your commitment to this story.